We proceed now to the fourth of our lectures on medieval developments in the history of Christian theology. We're going to continue on our Western track, looking at developments in Western medieval theology, especially in Northern Europe, in France, in Paris. Paris was the place to be in the 13th century where the greatest minds congregated in the University of Paris, including one of the greatest minds who ever lived, Thomas Aquinas, the great Roman Catholic theologian, the great scholastic medieval theologian. Scholastic theologian is a title for people like Thomas who were university professors. And universities were relatively new development in Western culture. St. Anselm, two centuries earlier, whose work we had discussed in the previous lecture, was a monk. He lived in a monastery. He taught at a monastery, not in a university. Monastic theology was the mainstream of Western theology, as it was also the mainstream of Eastern theology, until the 12th and 13th centuries with the rise of university-based theology, which was called scholasticism because it was the theology of the schools, the theology of the universities. And to repeat, the great scholastic is Thomas Aquinas. There are others, Bonaventure, uh, Peter Lombard, but um, Thomas Aquinas is the great representative, the most important distinctively Roman Catholic theologian in the tradition. Now, scholasticism is not just a social location, the theology of the schools. It is also an intellectual method. What had happened in the 12th century is that the works of Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher and student of Plato, had begun to be translated into Latin and become available, therefore, to these Western theologians, all of whom worked in Latin. Most importantly, well, not most importantly, but very importantly, is the logic of Aristotle. Aristotle is the first great logician. He wrote treatises on logic and he gave a he gave the world a vision of logic as a tool of knowledge, especially a tool of science. For Aristotle, a science was going to be set out in the form of logical deductions or syllogisms, he called them. And what's striking is the scholastic theologians did have the notion that theology should be a science in this sense. It should be ultimately expressible in a form of logical deductions sort of like geometry, based on revelation in Holy Scripture, and you'll get this scientific body of doctrine. Theology as science is a typically scholastic idea. Now, um, a theology that's all pure deduction may sound boring, but let me say two things about that. If you like logic, then try reading Thomas Aquinas sometime. Um, there's a kind of logical poetry in Thomas Aquinas, a kind of clarity and depth of thought and insight expressed in logical syllogisms that is just breathtaking. Um, reading Aquinas is like nothing else in the world in terms of just the depth of thought. The other thing about this is that surrounding the scientific statement of syllogisms or logical deductions is a method of disputation, it's called. Scholastic theology proceeded by way of disputation. This involved, in fact, formal debates in the universities, but the formal debates are actually represented and um, mirrored in the texts that we have from these medieval scholastic theologians. The texts will typically, typically be organized in terms of objection and reply. Um, so, for instance, a scholastic theologian will want to argue for a certain position in theology, but the first thing he'll do is list a bunch of objections to that position. And after he develops his view, he'll have to reply to each one of those objections. So this back and forth, this logical back and forth is called dialectic, going back to Aristotle. The logical back and forth is the form of disputation. Now imagine someone um, talking about faith and reason here. Um, this is faith and reason united in a deep way, and it's indeed, I think of it as sort of critical reasoning on steroids. Um, disputation, logic, science, um, the Eastern Orthodox looking over at this stuff say, mm, you really want to take logic that far? Well, the West did. 
and the, the idea that theology could be a science, an academic discipline in which disputation and logic are united with faith and this deep union of faith and reason have always been from that point on a deep part especially of Roman Catholic theology. Another feature of the disputation method and very important feature is that these Western theologians would try to reconcile apparent contradictions that they found in the Christian tradition. They, they now had in Paris, say in the 13th century, better libraries than they had before, better collections of books, and they could see that there were some tensions between, say, what Dionysus said about seeing God and what Augustine said about seeing God. That's a tension that we described in an earlier lecture, and I also described how Thomas Aquinas tried to reconcile those two. That's a typical medieval thing to do. A great theologian like Aquinas will look at different strands of the tradition, worry about possible contradictions, and try to find ways of interpreting the tradition so that it comes out harmoniously. And sometimes that requires the invention of sophisticated new concepts, like the concept of supernatural grace. The idea is to take these authorities in the tradition and see the whole tradition as speaking harmoniously, even if they sometimes speak in different voices. The authorities, by the way, mean authoritative books. This is a bookish culture. Even physics is done by reading books, reading the physics of Aristotle, which you find in a book. So the authorities are, first and foremost, the Bible, secondly, Augustine, then the other church fathers. Um, Aristotle is also an authority, at least in matters of philosophy and physics and logic. Um, and you want to make all the authorities come out in agreement if possible. If, if you can't, well, then as a last resort, you can reject an authority, right? You can reject Aristotle, he's only a pagan. You really don't want to reject Augustine if you can help it, but if necessary, even Augustine can be wrong. And of course, the Bible can't be wrong. So any th interpretation you give has got to preserve the, the truth of, of the Bible. So that's how medieval theology works um, in its scholastic form. Let me give you two examples of the intellectual depth of scholastic theology. And we'll take both of these examples from Thomas Aquinas, two very influential um, bits of theology that Aquinas did. First of all, the notion of analogy, using analogy as a way of speaking about God. This is going to be a technical term, it's not just any analogy, and it's a very interesting, I think, and deep thought about how we speak about God. Because after all, how do we speak about an incomprehensible God? Well, let's look at the problem more carefully with Thomas Aquinas in mind. For Thomas, the big problem is that God is simple. Simple, again, as I've suggested earlier, is a technical term. It means God has no parts. But God is radically simple in the following way. Everything God has, God is. So God doesn't just have wisdom, God is wisdom, capital W. God doesn't just have goodness, God is the supreme good. He is eternal good. He is the eternal wisdom. He can't not be wisdom. Right? He is these good things that he has. We simply have wisdom. Socrates maybe is wise, but God is wisdom itself. So the wisdom, goodness, justice, and beauty of God, put them all in capitals if you will, are God, and that means that there are a very different kind of wisdom and justice and beauty and goodness than anything we know in the creation. And the problem about speaking of God is our language comes from our experience with created things. We know what wisdom is like in a human being. We know what justice is like in a human being or a society. But what is justice itself like when justice is God? The eternal justice, um, which is no different from God, which is in some way no different from God's wisdom because God is wisdom, he is justice, he is beauty, so that in, in some deep way, Justice, beauty, wisdom, goodness are all really the same thing. They are different words for the same one reality of God. How can we make sense of that? Well, we do use these words, right? Justice, wisdom, beauty, goodness. What are we doing when we apply these words to God, when we don't really understand in any deep way what God is in his own being? Well, let's think about how that kind of talk about God is different from mere metaphor. Um, 
because Thomas wants to have analogies, not metaphors. It's a metaphor when you talk about God by saying, say, God is a rock. It's a metaphor because, well, one of the features of metaphor, rather, is you can't draw logical deductions from it. You can't deduce from the saying, God is a rock, that God is hard. Right? Now, you can use this metaphor. It's very important. It's, it's there in Scripture. So it's, it's perfectly good for Christians to use the metaphor, God is a rock, or God is like a rock. We'll use metaphors like that in religious poetry, in liturgy, but you can't make a science out of it because you can't draw logical deductions from it. You can't say, God is a rock, therefore he must be hard, he must be made out of something like granite. No, that's not, that's not true. That kind of logic doesn't work. But suppose you say, God is good. That's not a metaphor, that's analogy. And you can actually draw logical conclusions from it. You can say, God is the supreme good, therefore he is supremely just. And that's a deduction that is logically valid. It can be part of a science of theology, which of course is what Aquinas wants because he wants to have an Aristotelian science of theology. So, how is it that we can talk this way about God even though we don't really understand in any deep way what we're saying? Well, we talk by analogy. We do, after all, know something about what goodness and justice are in the created world. And there is some relation between goodness and justice in the created world and goodness and justice in God. And that relation can be stated, well, fairly simply. The key principle is that every created thing is like God. Now, this is an irreversible principle. God is not like any created thing but every created thing is like God. Think of it this way. God creates the world and every created thing is good. Why? Because God is good and he doesn't make anything evil. So because God is good and the source of all good, everything in creation is good by nature. So the goodness of the creation stems from the goodness of God. God always acts in a way like himself you might say. And Thomas does say something like this. Um, God always acts like himself. He's a good creator, therefore the creation is good. He is beautiful, therefore the creation is beautiful. He is just, therefore the creation is justly ordered until we get free will and sin. So, we've got this systematic basis for analogy. The analogy is the creation is like the creator. We can use these words and apply them to, to the creator even though we're applying them, as it were, in a higher sense. We don't know what justice really is in God because it's beyond our comprehension, and yet we know that our justice on earth is some kind of resemblance, shadow, image, or reflection, uh, or likeness of the justice of God. And that's what makes analogy possible. That's what makes it possible to make logical deductions like, if God is the supreme good, then he must also be just. Let me illustrate in a little more depth this notion of analogy by talking about one specific and highly um, controversial and interesting analogy, the analogy of being. When we say that God has being and then we say uh, a tree has being or a human being has being, we're talking about two different kinds of being. Right? The one being is like the other because the being of the creature is like the creator. Every creature, every created thing has being because God, the supreme being, gave it being. So the being of the creation is like the being of the creator, but it's not the same kind of being. God has a different kind of being from the created, uh, the created being. Why? Well, just as in every other case, what God has, God is. God has being, God is being. God is being itself. You and I and other creations of God are not being itself. We have being. Thomas will say we have being by participation in God's being. We have being that's dependent on our having a share in what God gives us by creating us. We have being by participation, which means we don't have being essentially. We don't have to be. For many, many aeons, none of us existed, and we don't have to exist forever. God does not have to keep us in being forever. Whereas God necessarily, essentially, always has being because God is his own being. 
So God's being is not like our being. And then here's one of the crucial consequences of this. I think this is actually very important. God is not one being among others is the consequence. God is not one being among others. It's not like, oh, well, there's tables and chairs and human beings and dogs and cats. and Oh, yes, and there's this other being called God. He's one of the, 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 the series of beings that we're talking about. No. God's being is at an entirely different order because it's the source of all being. Now, you may remember Pseudo Dionysus talked about God's essence or being as being above essence. Thomas Aquinas is trying to give another way of explaining why God is just not the same as one being among others. But instead of saying God is beyond being, he says God is being itself. But by being being itself, God is different from any other being and God is not one being among others. I think that's actually very important theologically. So there's a a great deal of intellectual depth in this stuff and I think theologically very important and especially if you want to do theology in any way that's like a university discipline or a science. And I think it's also lovely to think that all all creation is in some way like God. Um, Every tree, for instance, in Thomas's metaphysics participates in God's being because it has being and is like God in that way and participates in God's goodness because insofar as it is a tree, it's a good thing and that's like God who is the supreme good. And trees are beautiful and that's like God's beauty, a tiny, dim reflection of the beauty of God distant, right? but, but nonetheless a reflection of the beauty of God. And likewise, in some way the, the, the beauty and the, the organization of the tree, its, its ability to grow and flourish is, is a kind of built-in wisdom of the tree that reflects the wisdom of the Creator. There's also a kind of well-ordered justice about it. If the tree is not dying, suffering from evil and rot and decay and, and that kind of non-being that is the nature of evil. Insofar as the tree has being, it is good, it is beautiful, it is just, it is true, and thus reflects the goodness and beauty and justice and truth of God. And that's also why, although God is one and simple, and in God, justice and beauty and wisdom really are ultimately the same thing because they're all the same as God, yet that one simplicity does unfold in a multiplicity of different creations, Um, The one is the source of the many, and therefore we have many different ways of talking about God, many different analogies for God, goodness, beauty, justice, truth. Those are all different ways of talking about the same simple reality of God. So if you have a a feel for logic and concepts, right? I think you can find something very beautiful and very powerful about this way of doing theology. It takes a little getting used to, but I think... um, once you get used to it, it's, um, it opens up vistas of understanding that are quite beautiful. Now on to something a bit more specifically Christian in its theology, because Thomas's notion of analogy is something that, that um, well, you might think Muslims and, pa- and Platonists might want to use too. But now we'll talk um, about specifically Christian notions of grace. We're going to get back now to the notion of supernatural grace, which back in lecture 12, I suggested was Thomas's way of solving a problem about how to reconcile Dionysus on the one hand and Augustine on the other hand. And I mentioned then that supernatural grace is created grace, not uncreated grace. So now I'd like to say a little bit more about this distinctively Thomistic concept of created grace. And by Thomistic, I simply mean the the theology of Thomas Aquinas. So Thomistic means coming from Thomas. Thomas has this doctrine of supernatural grace and he calls it created grace. That is, the grace that Thomas is talking about is not the same as the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit can be called grace, capital G, but that's uncreated grace because that's God in person. He's talking about a created form in our soul. That, that's what Thomas identifies with the supernatural. Why does he do that? Right? And we'll talk about that and then we'll talk about what he means by it. First of all, why does he do it? He's disagreeing with an earlier scholastic theologian named Peter Lombard, 12th century University of Paris professor, later Bishop of Paris, who writes a book called Sentences, which is the great medieval textbook of theology. Well, in this textbook, Lombard said 
that the love of God in our souls, our love for God when we love God with our whole heart, mind, and strength, which the medieval tradition calls charity, this love of God in obedience to the command of God is no different from the Holy Spirit. Remember, we have mentioned for Augustine, the Holy Spirit is the love of God in the Trinity. The, the Holy Spirit is love in person within the Trinity, as it were. Lombard says our love for God is in fact no different from the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts and being our love for God. That's a rather radical view of, uh, of, of our love for God and, and, and of our relationship and our intimacy with the divine spirit dwelling within us. And most theologians looked askance at that. They said, well, there's something wrong here. Shouldn't our love for God be in some sense ours? Shouldn't it be human, not uncreated? So the doctrine of created grace is a way of trying to explain why our love for God and all the other Christian virtues really belong to us even though they, they are a gift of God. So the gift of God does include the indwelling Holy Spirit. There's no question of that. There is such a thing as uncreated grace, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. But this uncreated grace in us, the Spirit dwelling in our hearts, leaves a kind of impact in our hearts which can be called created grace. That's the supernatural grace that Thomas is talking about. Now, if created grace is going to be a real part of who we are, it's going to have to form our souls. This is an Aristotelian notion, going back to Aristotle, and Thomas is an Aristotelian. Thomas has learned his Aristotle and he thinks that Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, gives us a lot of concepts we can use to understand our moral and even our spiritual lives. Most important in many ways is this Aristotelian notion of form. And this takes a little getting used to, so let's, let's give an example. Things are formed and they have being because of their form, according to Aristotle. Think about um, a pot or a bowl. Um, let's say a bowl. A bowl is what it is because of its shape or form, not because of what it's made of. What it's made of is its material or matter. But a bowl can be made of glass or clay or plastic. It can be made of all sorts of things. What it's made of doesn't make it what it is. Its form or shape makes it what it is. Likewise, oh, well, think of something more complex like a piano. Right? You can make pianos out of very different materials. Um, not, not out of any material, but you can use different ways of, of putting it together. But it's got to have the right form, the right structure in order to be a piano. So for Aristotle, form is what determines what things are, not material. Right? Not what they're made of. So what they're made of doesn't make them what they are. Their form makes them what they are. Now, grace, created grace, is a form in the soul. What does that mean? It means that it forms our activities. It gives a certain shape to the soul that forms our activities in the form of virtues. Virtues are forms in the soul. Um, there's a good analogy here would be a skill. Skills are also forms in the soul. So let's think about virtues and skills, which are uh, very similar in many ways. Both of them form the soul, but, but skill is a better analogy to start with. Um, think of a piano player, someone who has skill at playing the piano. Think about how their, the movements of their fingers are well-formed, not clumsy. Right? The, there's going to be a pattern to how they use their fingers, that the form of the skill of piano playing. That form goes from their, well, it goes back from their fingers into their brains, right, into their, into their soul, in their heart. Really good piano player will have somehow the pianos in their heart, right? Well, virtue, likewise, is a form in our soul that forms all of the activities of the soul, its thoughts, its feelings, its perceptions. A virtuous person thinks and feels and perceives the world differently from a vicious person. Vicious meaning having vice in their soul, vice being the opposite of virtue. A virtuous person, um, let me give an example of a virtue, say honesty. An honest person just 
thinks differently from a dishonest person. An honest person thinks about the world differently from a dishonest person. An honest person feels differently about cheating, say, than a dishonest person. An honest person is not attracted by the prospect of getting away with cheating, and a dishonest person is. So an honest person's soul is formed differently from a dishonest person's. Their activities, their habits are different. And indeed, in, um, in Aristotle, uh, both virtues and skills are habits. This is an interesting word. Um, a habit is something you have that shapes your activities but isn't the same thing as an activity. A skill is a habit because you have that skill, say, even when you're asleep. A pianist who is asleep, she's still a pianist even when she's sleeping. She has the skill even when she's not using it. But the skill gives shape to her activities, to the way she plays the, the instrument. Likewise, an honest person, a courageous person, is honest and courageous even when sleeping, even when not doing honest and courageous things. The other thing about a habit that's very important, habits don't change very quickly. An honest person is not going to become a dishonest person overnight, not likely. A piano player is not likely to lose her skill at playing the piano overnight, unless somehow you, you bang her on the head and she, she you know, caused brain damage. Aside from that, a, a pianist is not likely to lose that skill overnight also not likely to gain the skill overnight. Habits take a while to form, they take a while to break. That's because they're such a deep part of the soul. Um, and by the way, you can, uh, for purposes of Christian theology, you can make soul equivalent to heart. So it's a deep part of your heart. Think of how the heart of a piano player is shaped by love of the piano. The heart of an honest person is shaped by love of truth. That is a deep part of the soul, it's not going to go away. Right? Even one dishonest act is not likely to demolish the whole habit of honesty, although it might be the beginning of losing the habit of honesty. So created grace is the basis of virtues. It's not the same thing as the virtues, but it's the basis of virtues. That is to say, created grace forms our soul in such a way that our soul is glad to engage in supernatural virtues. Let's get back to that term. Grace is supernatural, it elevates us above our natural abilities and makes possible for our souls things that weren't possible otherwise. The three crucial things it makes possible in this life are faith, hope, and love, the three theological virtues. Created grace, supernatural grace, elevates our souls so that we can believe in Christ, which is a gift of grace. We can't believe without grace. That goes back to Augustine. We don't really ever get to faith in Christ without the gift of grace. That's a supernatural virtue. Pagans can't have that virtue until they're converted by grace. Likewise, hope, which means specifically hope in everlasting life in Christ. Specifically Christian virtue, specifically supernatural, specifically a result of this created supernatural grace forming our souls. Likewise, most important of all, charity or love for God and neighbor. Briefly, let me mention, charity is an old word for Christian love. It did not mean giving money to the poor. The word for that was almsgiving. Charity is any act of loving God or your neighbor in obedience to the command of Christ who commanded you to love both God and neighbor, echoing the Old Testament commands. Charity is that kind of love. Giving to the poor can be one form of charity, but it's only one. Uh, so don't confuse charity with almsgiving. Charity is the proper love of God and neighbor. So faith, hope, and charity, the three theological virtues. There are other virtues that are natural virtues, not supernatural. Um, they're called the cardinal virtues or the moral virtues. They include justice, courage, temperance, and prudence. And the Catholic view is pagans can have those virtues. There can be courageous, just, temperate, and prudent, and even wise pagans. But pagans do not have faith in Christ, do not have hope for everlasting life in Christ, and do not have charity the love of God and neighbor, loving God above all other things and whole heart, mind, and soul. So the supernatural virtues are called theological virtues because they're specifically Christian, specifically supernatural, rooted in supernatural grace. Let me say a couple more things about this very important concept of supernatural grace because it is so important for Catholic theology for, well, up to this day. This is the central Catholic, Roman Catholic notion of grace. This grace in our heart is called sanctifying grace. This habit 
this supernatural habit in our heart. It's called sanctifying grace. It's actually a translation of a Latin phrase that means grace that makes acceptable. Gratia gratum faciens, grace that makes acceptable or gracious. The presence of sanctifying supernatural created grace in our hearts makes us acceptable to God. God looks at this grace forming our hearts and says, now that's a good heart. That's the kind of heart I want in the kingdom of God. Sanctifying grace sanctifies, makes acceptable, makes us fit for heaven and the beatific vision. So, we can think of three different forms of this supernatural grace, very briefly. First, there is what Thomas calls the light of glory, this elevation that happens in the beatific vision so that we can see the very essence of God which is beyond our natural capacity, but the supernatural grace elevates us so that we can see the essence of God. I mentioned that in lecture two. Then there's sanctifying grace which makes us acceptable to God and is the basis of the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, which we've been talking about so far. And third, let me mention, the, there is at the very beginning of human existence the original justice or righteousness of Adam and Eve, which was a supernatural gift which maintained them in righteousness and justice before God, before they sinned. So, at the beginning of human existence, original righteousness is a form of supernatural grace. In our current human existence, in this life, sanctifying grace is a form of supernatural created grace. And lastly, the light of glory by which we see the beatific vision and are elevated to see a vision of God that's not naturally possible for us, that's also the third and final and ultimate form of supernatural created grace, a key concept in scholastic theology that will become a key concept in Roman Catholic theology for centuries to come.